So while we're all coming in and getting settled, if I could ask everybody to shift towards the middles of your sections so that when people do come in a little bit later, they can just slide right into the aisle seats. Um, a lot of these panels have been going to capacity or further, and it makes it a lot easier and less awkward if no one has to climb over each other in the middle of the thing. Can I say that we have this mic here, so if people want to shout out questions, we'll pick them up on that mic. They don't necessarily have to come up and use. Okay. Okay. Um, and I can just repeat if it comes out quietly. Yeah. Okay, it is 1.30, so we are going to start this panel in tradition with Theorizing the Web's enjoyment of being timely and punctual. Uh, my name is Whitney Aaron Basil. I am part of the Theorizing the Web organizing committee, and I am super excited to welcome you all to this panel this afternoon. Our first panelist is Jeff Schulenberger. He's a lecturer in the expository writing program at New York University. His writing has appeared in Descent, Jacobin, Psycho <laughs> Cyborgology, which I should be able to say. <laughs> I write for them. Um, <laughs> and elsewhere. Uh, next is Alex Ward Andrews, uh, who works as a full, senior full stack developer at Outlandish, which is an ongoing experiment in what, is, what it is to run a worker cooperative in the tech industry. He is co founder of Creative Commons record label Records on Ribs and has collaborated with Lucky PDF and Auto Italia Southeast, where he was a technical consultant in their project Immaterial, Immaterial Labor Isn't Working. Nor is my voice. Uh, Kendra Albert is a Harvard Law School JD candidate and law clerk at Zeitgeist Law. They are also an affiliate at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, where they worked for two years as a research associate. They are deeply interested in preventing online abuse, all law related to the internet that is not patent law, video games, and gender. Finally, Brit Brittany Summit Gill is a doctoral candidate at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a regular contributor to cyborgology. Yes. Uh, her research investigates the intersections of class and gender in consumer culture and the role of digital and mass media in identity formation. So thank you all for coming. Look forward to having a great discussion during the Q&A. And Jeff is going to start. Thinking of moving this over a bit. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm talking today about a uh, uh, thinker named Rene Girard, who's a died in November of last year, 2015, and his relationship with a venture capitalist by the name of Peter Thiel, who may be quite familiar to many of you, is a pretty well-known figure in the tech world. So um, I'll get started. Basically, um, what I'm going to do to start out with is um, go back to 2004, July, um, the middle of July in 2004 when there was a conference uh, entitled po Politics and Apocalypse held at Stanford University. Um, and the purpose of the conference, as it was later reported, was um, to discuss current affairs in a leisurely way with Stanford professor Rene Girard, this guy. Um, and at first glance, this symposium, if you look through the proceedings which are later published as the book Politics and Apocalypse in 2007, resembled many other symposia held at American universities during the years after uh, September 11, 2001. In fact, I attended some symposia that looked similar in certain ways in this period, right? That people were discussing uh, the concept of the state of exception, you know, Walter Benjamin, Carl Schmitt, that kind of thing. And um, so what, what's interesting, if you look through the list of participants in this book, Politics and Apocalypse, is that uh, one of them was not, in fact, a, a university professor, as were all of the rest, but rather Peter Thiel, who at the time was the president of Clarium Capital. So Peter Thiel, um, this guy, has been called uh, by the New Yorker the world's most successful technology investor in 2011. He's also been described variously as a philosopher CEO, which is a term he seems to have embraced. Um, his connection to René Girard, his former teacher at Stanford from when he was an undergraduate in the late 80s, is pretty well established. Um, you know, there's no, no secret here. Um, in fact, um, there's a foundation called Imitatio, which is a foundation that supports uh, work based on René Girard's theories. And in fact, it's part of Thiel's personal foundation. It's kind of a branch of it. Okay? So the relationship is pretty well established. Um, so what's interesting is that 
Um, for anybody who's familiar with Thiel's career, the summer at which this symposium took place that he participated in was quite an eventful one because it was the same summer in which he made a $500,000 investment in Facebook, um, which at the time was a relatively little known startup, and this was its first outside funding, right, as an angel investment. So these two events happened within about a month of each other. Um, so, you know, his investment in Facebook is kind of a well-known part of his career in popular culture. It's, you know, when he's interviewed, it's one of the, I mean, he's invested in many things, but it's the one that usually gets brought up, and here's how it's represented, here's the scene it's represented in, in the social network, the movie. Um, so, what is interesting here is that, um, according to many accounts, um, what made Thiel see the potential of Facebook before anyone else, again, he was its first outside investor, um, has been reported to be his involvement in the theories of René Girard. So, in fact, if you um, looked at René Girard's obituary when he died in November of last year, which interestingly was penned by Quentin Hardy, who, if you read the New York Times, is usually writing about startups and the sort of venture capital world, but took time off to write the um, obituary of René Girard, and interestingly in this obituary he um, directly made the connection between Thiel's involvement with René Girard and his um, early investment in Facebook. So um, here we see you know, the section of the obituary where he talks about this. He gets the number wrong. It was in fact half a million and not a hundred thousand. But um, so he quotes Steele as saying that Facebook first spread by word of mouth, and it's about word of mouth, so it's doubly mimetic. <clears throat> um, and following up by saying social media proved to be more important than it looked because it's about our natures. So there was some buzz about this afterwards, including a, a business analyst named Arnaud Auger, who uh, called Girard the godfather of the like button after reading this. So. Um, you know, it's, it's been discussed somewhat in, in um, business reporting since then. Um, so, but overall, what's interesting to me is that, you know, given that this connection between Thiel and Girard, and thus the, the sort of early rise of Facebook has been mentioned with some frequency, mimetic theory has not really been widely used in social analyses of the internet, um, to my knowledge. It's, um, the, such analyses are pretty, um, pretty uh, few between. So this is especially interesting given that it is actually quite similar on a superficial level to the much more often discussed meme theory, right? Which similarly to Girard's theories, you know, meme theory which derives out of Dawkins as the selfish gene and then it's sort of codified in the book The Meme Machine by Susan Blackmore, you know, has obviously been applied broadly um, and in a way has become, has sort of become part of our everyday vocabulary. Um, for talking about a whole range of, of phenomena online. Um, so, on a, again, on a superficial level, there's a, a certain resemblance between um, Girard's mimetic theory and meme theory. But I would argue that, actually, um, mimetic theory has certain advantages over meme theory, specifically because meme theory, and I'm, I'm drawing this argument from somebody who has actually compared them extensively, named Matthew Taylor, um, but uh, meme theory tends to reify memes and separate them from social contexts in which their circulation is embedded. So in other words, it, it sort of lends memes a kind of autonomous logic of replication, but doesn't really situate them within an account of um, social structures, which Girard's theory, in contrast, does, right? That's, in fact, its main purpose. So. Um, I'd like to just give a brief overview of Girard's theory, which is based around this concept of mimetic desire, because I think it's actually, again, relatively unfamiliar. So um, Girard's theory is uh, quite simple in its basic framework. I mean, it's incredibly simple and is actually uh, an odd thing to come out of sort of 1960s French theory, because you can actually describe it in like a sentence. Um, so, oops, I've, I've gone too far here. Uh, so um, this, uh, this illustration encapsulates it pretty nicely, right? And it's often referred, um, Girard's account of mimetic desire is often interchangeable with the term triangular desire. The basic idea is that any desire is mediated through a model. So um, to go back to the previous slide, actually, 
you know, it, 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 it's congruent with certain aspects of psychoanalytic theory. Um, the question is, how do we know what we desire? Um, this is quoting from Zizek. There's nothing spontaneous, nothing natural about human desires. Our desires are artificial. We have to be taught to desire. So Girard is thinking along the same lines. But in his account, the way that we are taught to desire is through imitation, right? So we desire what others desire because we imitate their desires. So that's essentially what this model encapsulates. So now I think going back to um, the, this connection with which Thiel has already made, um, we can see how this could be a useful model for thinking about how social media work, right? Um, they make objects, images, texts, etc., appear um, through the mediation of the other. In other words, um, we uh, only perceive things as desirable because somebody else has already sort of tagged it as such. So the desire of the other is rendered visible by these kind of mechanisms um, and the structure of platforms. Um, so, but at the same time, they are structured to solicit further activity of the sort, right? That's their basic function. So um, the further point, I, which I think is interesting, is that um, a point that Girard often makes is that, you know, mimetic desire, we, we don't recognize it as a sort of powerful, fundamental trait because it seems so trivial, right? It seems essentially um, associated with things that we are kind of embarrassed by, right? So similarly, I think, you know, going back to Thiel's remark, you know, social media was more important than it looked. Um, I think the, the perception of triviality that preceded the sort of incredible traction and a widespread adoption of social media is an interesting link there as well. So, but, um, and I've got to rush here because I'm running out of time. What's interesting to me here is actually that um, even though people have made this connection that I've just been making, um, what people haven't made a connection to is that Girard is also thinking about violence quite fundamentally, right? Um, so there's an, the sort of business analyst cute side of it is, oh, like Peter Thiel learned this really cool thing from this philosopher and he applied it to making lots of money on Facebook. There's a much darker side to this, which is that according to Girard, um, this mimetic structure of desire uh, produces violence. Um, so, and it, this violence sort of cascades across society. This is what he calls a sacrificial crisis. So in his argument, in traditional societies, um, this is managed through the mechanism of, uh, through the structures of religion and the mechanism of sacrifice, which um, sort of expels the collective violence onto a scapegoat, right, who is then deified and interestingly, sometimes uh, turned into a kind of king or monarchical figure, um, precisely because it has the function of organizing the community and creating its totality, right? So what's interesting to me here is that um, Thiel is you know, known for being quite right-wing and a libertarian, right? And um, for being involved with people who, you know, the people who said, oh, let's make you know, Eric Schmidt CEO of America, right? He's, He's sympathetic to that kind of position as well. So what's interesting is that he, um, and these are cribbed from some lecture notes that are on a website of one of his employees, Blake Masters. Um, but he's really using this to think about founders, in other words, tech, technology company founders, um, in relation to sort of Girard's accounts of mythology. Um, and, you know, basically these kind of cycles that um, both lift up um, these founder figures who he regards are kind of, as kind of um, creators of communities, right? And I think we can see how this would work for thinking about Facebook, right? Here's a quotation where he does this. Um, but those founder figures are also potentially scapegoats, right? So what's interesting here is that he's um, using this theory to think about both um, techniques of domination, right, um, and new ways of, uh, basically, technology is politics by other means. But at the same time, he's um, quite worried about the potential for um, violence being channeled towards figures like him, right? So um, I, I am actually out of time, but I can go further with this. But what's interesting to me is that he invested in Facebook at the same time that he also was involved in founding, I mean, the same year that he was also involved in founding Palantir Technologies, right, which is a national security 
um, data analysis company, right, which is connected with the Department of Defense and various intelligence services. So, you know, Thiel is thinking about um, the um, both the way that people in his position can wield power through these technologies as founders, again, to use the term that he likes, but also the ways that um, they might be threatened by that position and the techniques they need to develop to protect themselves. Okay. So that's all I can say for now, but thanks. And One thing I forgot to mention is that for those of you who are live tweeting, if you could tag your tweets with both the conference hashtag, which is TTW16, and then uh, B5, which is the tag, or C5, oh my god, C5, which is the tag for this particular panel. And again, I think there's like maybe one empty seat in the room or two. If you are next to an empty seat, can you please scoot over so that someone lurking on the edge can sit next to you? There's one seat over here. Hello. Uh, hi, um, I'm Alex Ward Andrews. Uh, I am on the Twitters. Oh, hold on, this isn't working. <laughs> One second. There will be a moment during Q&A when I'll ask the sort of like if anything super interesting or noteworthy happened on the hashtag stream. And I would really appreciate if anyone could kind of help the remote participants get their yeah, questions so into the Q&A through your voice. Then go view presentation mode. View presentation mode. Then we just click on the screen. Okay. Apologies for that. Okay, so that's, that's me uh, on the internet. Uh, I work for this company. Uh, we're a digital cooperative, I'm interested in social change. If you're interested in social change within the digital sphere uh, and using technology for that, uh, and particularly if you're interested in cooperatives for digital workers, come and talk to me afterwards. I also have a few t-shirts. Right, this talk is about React. What is React? Well, React is, uh, at this most basic level, React is uh, a library in JavaScript for creating views on various things. Uh, but of course, like everything else these days, uh, React doesn't just simply name uh, this particular JavaScript library. It also names an ecosystem of related technology, all of which are produced by Facebook internally and all of which have been open source uh, thus far. So we've got uh, React, we've got um, the second one, which is called GraphQL, which is a data vector uh, data format. We have uh, Relay and we have Flux, and all these things are open source. They kind of form the basis of, uh, of, of the React ecosystem. So React is kind of a big deal. Um, this is just a few of the companies that use React in production right now. Um, there are many more, but I think it's interesting to note in passing what people aren't on that slide that are really big, i.e. Google, which I could have put on there. Um, if they were you know, using it, but they're not. And that's something interesting we might want to talk about in the Q&A, why certain companies are deliberately not adopting this technology, even though it is best in class, in my view, for this kind of thing. Uh, according to Facebook, there are uh, uh, a quarter of a million React developers. This is because there are a quarter of a million people who have downloaded the React, uh, uh, React Chrome plugin. Um, I think the number is probably higher. Uh, and there are certainly people who are aware of it or dabbled in it. Um, announced on the 13th of April 2016 was a strategic partnership between Facebook and React and Samsung and, Mic and Microsoft. Obviously a pretty big deal in this day and age. Uh, Microsoft, you know, traditionally a very uh, orthodox sof uh, software company in many ways, but they're certainly getting involved uh, in this technology. So, uh, React. Um, what, why, did, why did Facebook internally develop it? Well, Facebook, um, as, as a website, as with all websites, copes with a number of uh, complicated uh, UI problems. So, for example, uh, in, this, in this particular slide, we can see this 
uh, probably familiar to you, but not familiar to me, because I'm not on Facebook, uh, slide, <laughs> uh, which shows the chat interface. Obviously, there's a lot going on. There's the thing at the top, which is, you know, shows the amount of notifications you have. There's the, there's this thing at the side, which shows, you know, the current status of your chat, what's open, what's closed, what, what, what view you're seeing. Obviously, this is like, when it's initially rendered, that's quite simple. But the problem comes, which happens all the time on Facebook, is when new data comes in or new information comes in. So then what you have to do is you have to go out and basically, in the traditional mode, which is a problem React solves, you have to go out into that world, you have to work out what the, the status of everything that exists on the page is at the moment, and then you need to convert, convert and then you need to like move the pieces around. So you need to like increase the number of uh, unseen messages, blah de blah, uh, you know, put put the put the next chat conversation into the text box and so on and so forth. Um, but this actually becomes a really complicated problem. And if you look, this is not big enough on the slide, but there's a lot of logic, there's a lot of complexity that goes in, and it's extremely error prone. And in this particular presentation, the engineer in question gives the fact that you may have seen in, in the past in Facebook, the notification thing always showed one and you clicked on it, you didn't actually have any notifications. And this is a bug which was, which was caused particularly by this problem, by the problem of the code was way too complicated, no one could understand how all the pieces fit, fit together, and React was a solution to this problem. So, why, why is it a solution to a problem? So firstly, what about if we eliminate the fact that we have to reach out into the, into the world of the DOM, which is the, the way that uh, JavaScript represents the state of the HTML on the page? What if instead we could just forget about that and we, we would only reach out into it when we really had to? We didn't have to go over the page, check the state of everything that exists, and then, and then, uh, and then change it if you need to change it. So what if we were, in programming terms, declarative? What if we just said, OK, Given this state, this is what it looks like. Given this state, this is what it looks like. What would it, what would it mean if we were that? Uh, it would make things a lot simpler, and I'll demonstrate in a moment with a little coding example. Uh, so we don't reach out into the real world, the real world, i.e. The, the DOM in this case, or as we'll see, several other real worlds, unless we have to. Instead, we virtualize the real world, or in this case, we virtualize the state of the DOM into something that Facebook have termed the virtual DOM, which is essentially a really a uh, complicated graph of the existing state of the web page or the existing state of the React application. So how does this work? Uh, so we take account of the way things look and we keep it the real world here, JavaScript DOM. Um, we call this the virtual DOM one for the sake of argument. Uh, then the world changes. So some kind of network thing happens or some information <laughs> comes in or blah, 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 that kind of thing occurs. Uh, so what we do, we fire uh, all the components. So each of those little individual things, the chat window, the, the, the notification icons, so on and so forth. They're all components. What we do is we fire them and we say, like, what do you look like now? Given this state of the world, what do you look like now? And we, we go through every single one on the page and we see, uh, see what it looks like and we call this virtual DOM2. Then what we do is we diff these two, these two states. We go, does virtual DOM1 equal virtual DOM2? If that's the case, then we don't do anything at all. We completely <coughs> sit, sit still, the web page doesn't change because nothing has actually changed in the view layer. Uh, but if there's a change, we take the change and apply it to the real world. Uh, in this case, the JavaScript DOM. And you know, we can think about the real world and politics around virtualization and that sort of jazz as we go on. Right, so this is actually a technique that is used commonly in video gaming, which shows uh, how to do it. And this, this is a very common technique uh, in doing highly complicated graphics in video games, where you just take the state, you work out if there's any changes need to be applied to the graphical interface, and then you apply them. Okay, so now I'm going to do something extremely dangerous, and I'm going to try and find the mouse. Okay. <laughs> this is, of course, this presentation is itself written in React because I am like that. So what we can do is click this button, and we keep clicking the button, and wicked, oh, if we go over six, okay, okay, it's gone red, great. Right, how does this work? So what we do is we have a React component. We import the React library, uh, we you know, make a new class, and the first thing that we do is we st set state of the world uh, to zero. Then we have the styles. Then we have if it's if it's greater than zero, then we're going to make it say key clicking. And if it's not, then we're going to make it red. So we and then when we click, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going. And then at this point, when the state count is six, then we change something. And then this point when this is run, then we'll actually touch the quote unquote real world. Okay, so let's talk about the real world. So in this case, uh, we diff the thing and we might output to the web. But what Facebook discovered is they could also output 
to anything else on the web, for example, scalable vector graphic format. But they could also output, and this is where it gets really interesting, to phones. They could react uh, in a system called React Native. They could go onto iOS or Android. They were completely independent. So the same React library could be used and output to here. Uh, they can also do it on the terminal. Uh, they can do it on native OSs. There's some experience with that. They can do it on the VR. They can do it on the Oculus. This is the same code, the same libraries, but they're outputting in a different place. Uh, anywhere you need an UI or anywhere you need to program, so what they've created, and this is, this is a slide from their own presentations, is there's a layer above React, then there's various output formats that are a platform above uh, that this stuff can be outputted on. And you can, in theory, have the same user interface, uh, exactly the same code, run on iOS, run on Android, run on web. Um, so obviously, this is what they say, it's run right once, run everywhere. And this is a very telling comment that I'll return to, hopefully. Proprietary platforms will always differentiate and compete. And we can think about why Facebook are interested in this technology and why they want to have a layer like that rather than one that requires them to program individually on each platform natively. OK, right. Uh, and this has a widespread influence, not just in the way they react. Uh, it's also influenced other engineers at Facebook. So essentially, this uh, component kit author uh, is saying that they've stolen all their ideas from React internally and developed this thing called Component Kit, and I'm pretty 100% sure that everyone with Facebook on their phone has used it, because component, component Kit is the primary technology used to do the Facebook news feed. Okay, so what do they want from it? Right, first we should properize the term Facebook. What do we mean by Facebook? Do we mean Mark Zuckerberg himself personally, or do we mean uh, the organization? And obviously we can stratify the organization, do we mean the engineers, do we mean so on and so forth? I think it's important to to problematize that term in a, in a way. And what do we mean by React? Obviously, React's rubbish, so that didn't work very well, but there we go. Um, so what do we mean by React? Uh, we mean that React, not just simply the technology, although obviously by now you probably realize this technology has certain aspects that allow them to become independent of the given technological thing. But I also mean the open source project, their funding around it, the fact they have full-time engineers on it, the fact they have loads and loads of stuff about it that is occurring. So Facebook obviously find it useful. It powers a lot of their stuff. It can mean that people only have to learn one paradigm. They can move engineers around with ease. Uh, and obviously, that's great for Facebook. It means people can jump in, in and out of projects. It makes it very easy for people to understand code, and so on and so forth. So they certainly find it useful. But this is, doesn't answer the question as why they open sourced it. They could just keep this to themselves, and it's pretty proprietary and pretty useful for them to do. So. Why would you open source it? Well, in, in one sense, if you give away the goodies, some goodies come back to you. And certainly in two senses, firstly, uh, Facebook have made a few hires from people who have uh, highlighted themselves as very competent operators within the React community. And they have essentially uh, hired one or two, three pe pe people off this. And they've also embraced technologies that have come from this community, which actually offer a superior technical paradigm for what they have internally. For example, Redux over their internal implementation of Flux. Uh, so therefore, he'll get into the politics of this kind of, and he gives them platform independence, totalizing uh, independence above, as they are superintended in a virtual space, above a given software platform. So we return to this really quickly. Uh, it says, right once, once everywhere. So they don't have to worry about this very telling statement. The proprietary uh, platforms will always di uh, differentiate and compete. They can always end up just adding another output to their uh, React applications. Uh, say, you know, a new Windows phone comes along, or so on and so forth. So it's a virtualization, which is obviously an extremely hot topic within the world of computation at the moment. Uh, no one has actually, you know, built their own servers and turned them on. We could probably discuss that a bit more. Also, because these are all individual components, and you've decided to make the whole world uh, build these components, everything is, in theory, although I was going to try it for this presentation, but couldn't, uh, composable within Facebook. You can simply drop these things into Facebook, and it could potentially, again, in theory, become part of their problem. Uh, part of their platform. But also, more importantly, it gives them platform dominance in coding. It's encouraging a set of best practices and a rather problematic object called DX, which is developer experience. Uh, it's not these guys who you might remember from WWE back in the day. I had to get a wrestling slide in. It's the law. Um, <laughs> what DX is a platform logic, I would say, applied to coding itself. It provides these easy to use abstractions. It's incredibly easy methodology, uh, which is fun and useful and, 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 and powerful uh, to do it. At, and in the same way that Facebook is a convenient uh, place for the social, Facebook becomes a convenient place uh, for developers themselves. So we can think of a few things. We can think, hmm, thinking like a Facebook. Why are Facebook doing this? Well, we could say, and I you know, thank my panelists for bringing the other panelists we talked to before, there's a continuation of Facebook by other means. Uh, it's becoming a meta platform. The platforms on other platforms take as a platform. 
Uh, for example, they did have an attempt to try to do this with a platform they called Pars, which they then killed. But I wonder if they will bring it back, um, some kind of GraphQL service or so on and so forth, to allow this stuff to continue to occur. Uh, and obviously, we're thinking very much about the Facebook plan for world domination here. Uh, and what place does React and this kind of uh, DX-related developer outreach stuff have in that? Thank you very much. Sorry, that was really fast. discovered what the other panelists already knew, which is moving this thing is harder than it appears. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kendra Albert. Um, and the presentation I'm giving today is called Put Down the Talismans. Um, and it's less research and more of a like argue rant of, about the use of legal terms in non-legal spaces, specifically in anti-harassment policies and procedures. And this is built off my experience as both participating in online uh, in spaces for online anti-harassment advocates and as one myself, that we often turn to the law as like a solution for a set of problems around like experience, really horrific experiences online. So the alternate title for this presentation is The Law Will Not Save You. Um, and I'm a law student, so I can definitively, at least for the moment, say that. Um, so when I talk about talismans, what, I, what I, I'm choosing to define that as is a legal term of art, which is a term of art in itself. It means a legal thing out of place, invoked to make or justify substantive decisions that do not involve for formal legal process. So the idea here is that these are concepts that sort of get imported in slightly strange spl places that don't sort of fit into sort of what we would normally conceptualize as the court system. So perhaps the first and best example of this, but not the one I'm going to spend the bulk of my presentation on, is uh, free speech. Right, so this has been sort of widely mocked, the sort of bringing up of free speech and sort of as a like argumentative tactic in contexts in which it doesn't really make a ton of sense. Um, it's sort of become, I think, also kind of contextually meaningless, um, or at least separated from what like it constitutes legal knowledge. So maybe it isn't really legal at all when people talk about free speech, um, but when companies do, sometimes it is, right? So this is just a sampling of many of the different places we see platforms. Um, or companies, depending on how you want to frame uh, the platform word, uh, referring to free speech as a rhetorical tool to shore up like a particular position they've taken, whether it relates to free speech or not. Um, and so this has become so common that there is, in fact, an XKCD about it, um, right? And you see this sort of deployed online as, you know, the, in the government isn't involved. Why are we talking about the First Amendment? Why are we talking about free speech? But the actual example I want to spend the bulk of my time on today is defamation. Um, because I think it provides a useful sort of way to explore how what legal terms mean and how they uh, sort of have become involved in and related to the process of dealing with online abuse in sort of ways we may not expect, right? So uh, I know I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I will promise you uh, the defamation shows up in really weird places. Um, so the first one of these is Yik Yak, which it's an online communications platform. So the fact that they prohibit defamation is not particularly surprising. The second one of this is Dropbox. Um, so don't publish anything defamatory or store it on Dropbox. The third one of this is uh, Slack. So if you're saying defamatory things on Slack in your private Slack, that's against their terms. And the fourth one of this, if you uh, went to the Panera down the street and used their Wi-Fi, that's from that. <laughs> so they show up in weird places, right? Like it's like this is not what you would necessarily expect from using the Panera Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> um, 
And what they are is they're shorthand. They're references to a, like a body of knowledge stored elsewhere. So when I say defamation, what I mean is usually the legal concept of defamation. And it makes it sort of makes these guidelines feel less arbitrary because it doesn't say like don't be mean. It says defamation, which is something that both has the sort of legitimating function of the law. Um, to the extent that that's a legitimating function. Um, and also sort of makes it feel like, oh, there's something going on here that I can really understand. Like, someone knows what this word means. Um, it sort of avoids this kind of what might be a definitional problem of like what it is, because you have ton probably millions of pages written about what exactly constitutes defamation. And lastly, the other reason you can see these as shorthand, right, is because they aren't particularly uh, country specific, right? When Dropbox says don't no defamatory content, that could mean no defamatory content in the United States, and that can also mean no defamatory content in Japan. And what constitutes Japan defamatory content in Japan is very, very different than what constitutes it in the United States. So when you see uh, platforms invoke things like no otherwise illegal material, right? Like that is like. What does that mean? Well, that means that the lawyers didn't want to take the time to figure out what was illegal in every single jurisdiction that they wanted to do business in. So instead, they sort of use these kind of catch-all terms um, that aren't particularly specific, right? So there are good, so the basic summary of that is that there are really good reasons why these show up, right? I, the, my point of the presentation is not that like no one thought about this or that there isn't sort of a, a good that is served by these terms, but rather that we need to sort of unpack them more. And that's what I'm about to do with defamation. So um, what defamation means, right? Um, well, in the US, um, which is exceptional in its definition of defamation, um, but the one I'm most familiar with, so I'm going to focus on that. Um, what it means is that someone published a statement about another person. The statement is about like the plaintiff of the lawsuit. Um, it har the statement harmed the reputation of the plaintiff, that the person knew the statement was false, um, at least to some level of knowing, right? Depending on whether the person at in issue in the statement is like a public figure or their sort of level of fame, you can see a different standard for what knowing means, which if you think that that's like intelligible to people who are reading terms of service, I have a bridge to sell you in another borough, right? <laughs> and that the, the statement sort of isn't subject to some sort of privilege. And that's kind of dependent on which state you're in about which privileges apply. But it just took me, I don't know, something around 30 seconds to explain like the roughest outline of what defamation means, which is why it's shorthand. And it imports this really difficult concept, right? It says, okay, people have worried for a long time about what exactly it means to like defame someone, so we're gonna just put it here. Um, we don't want you to do that. But it also, as I've just suggested, pushes a sort of un unmeetable obligation onto a user, right? Like everyone laughed when I said, oh, like, your Slack. You can't say defamatory things on your Slack, or you can't say defamatory things on Panera's Wi-Fi, because who knows if we've said defamatory things in our Slack, or maybe you do, I don't know, uh, or on Panera's Wi-Fi, both because who knows all the things you said in Slack, but also who knows whether those things were defamatory. So by requiring users to meet the obligation of not providing defamatory content, the platform is kind of like being like, this is your problem and not mine. Despite the fact that I'm the one with the lawyers who wrote these terms, you are the one who is being sort of being held to them, right? No defamatory content from you. So the other reason why defamation is a, one of the other reasons why defa defamation is a particularly good example, it's super complicated. Um, so uh, it's really hard to apply. This is a dead white guy saying that, so you can believe that uh, it's not just me. Everyone has trouble with it. Um, so when we talk about invocations of the defamation talisman, we talk about what they mean in a historical context. So defamation is gendered. Um, in most, uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, including in England up until 2014, uh, saying things that impugn the chastity of a woman were per se libelous, which means you don't have to show that there's any reputational harm. And if you think that this is the Brits being weird, actually that's still true in New York. Um, and it used to be defamatory in the South uh, to suggest that someone was black when they were not in fact black, right? So it's racist. Um, and you know, of course, any invocation of women's chastity should remind us that their like, whorephobia is like a real thing 
and it shows up in defamation because we think it's calling, if you think calling a woman a whore is per se libelous, that's pretty demeaning to sex workers, right? And it's not just the actual law, right? It, it, the way the law gets enforced is also gendered. Um, women are often, this is a study that suggested that women are much more successful when they're suing for things like uh, impu things impugning on their chastity rather than when they're suing for sort of their place in a business world. Um, I'm gonna skip my example. Uh, so it whitewashes real problems. I sort of talked about the racial implications already. Additionally, you know, if you think uh, the primary people who use laws like defamation are uh, white men w with significant standing in communities, often like women of color and working class people just don't have the time or the money to pursue sort of reputational harms. So when all of these people use defamation, right, I'm just gonna argue that I don't think they're thinking about like libelous per se uh, invocations of unchaste women, right? They're just thinking, ah, defamation is bad, right? But of course, the law is not neutral and the law is both shapes the world and is shaped by it. And so when we, in, when we invoke these terms, when we're talking about online harassment, you know, that should make us really nervous that we're reinforcing these kind of historical, um, historical uh, power dynamics, right? And so even which laws apply are a contested site. So when we see these talismans, we should think that they're both overbroad and yet also too narrow. That a, a working class black woman might not actually be able to bring a defamation lawsuit and show that material is defamatory, but yes, yet also defamation doesn't cover much of what we think of as like online abuse, right? Um, and also, they invoke the power and obligations of the state. This is the XKCD point, right? This is like when we talk about bringing these terms in, they're meant to be used in courts of law where A, you have due process rights, but B, that like the state is the primary concern. And when, especially when we talk about free speech, platforms are powerful, but platforms as of yet, for the most part, cannot put you in jail, right? So the carceral power of the state is a really important thing to think about here. And most of all, and this is like my primary argument, these talismans substitute for real discussion of the values that define community spaces. When we talk about how, when we say no defamatory material, what we're saying is we haven't thought about what we don't want on here, but we know that def defamation is illegal and you know that should be good enough for us, right? And that represents, I think, for many people who actively experience online abuse, a like total thoughtlessness regarding what is actually a problem, right? Do you care if the thing that someone said about you is like true? Do you care if it's an opinion or a fact? Is that the, the relevant consideration or do you care about someone showing up in your mentions it, calling you all kinds of like four letter words, right? And like harassing you and like stalking you, right? You may care way less about the sorts of things that motivate defamation law because A, it's not the state, but B, that's just not the relevant consideration. So basically when we see these talismans, they invoke this kind of sense of bright line rules, these, but in practice, they're messy, both in the legal sense and in the enforcement. And the power of them is what makes them dangerous. When everyone says, oh, well, oh yes, we agree that we should not have defamatory material on this, on this platform, or oh yes, like we are referencing the law on this, that sort of forecloses a real conversation about like what the norm should be. So in my very few t little time remaining, um, and I'm happy to talk about this more, I'm gonna suggest that the, what we should really be thinking about is like what structures the policies invoke and what do those structures take for granted and who do they serve, right? We should be thinking fundamentally about what the goal is that we're trying to do with community norms rather than just saying, you know, the law has already kind of considered some things that are proximate to this, we'll just take it. So Towson's may be very pretty and they're really appealing, and they're, you know, why I went to law school, but we have to put them down. Thank you. I didn't want to take it down too early, because <laughs> as with the rest of the presentation, I Yeah. Um, I'll just talk about it. Get started, and then we'll go see if we can do something. Um, so, no, I'm just having
So this is a uh, sort of a test drive of my dissertation research and a uh, quick content warning, a brief, very brief mention of misogyny and suicidal ideation. So, so I, I think a lot about how people find belonging and build communities online. And it's not a hard sell here at Theorizing the Web to argue that we're living in an, an age of increasingly augmented sociality. More and more of our socializing happens online. and. In my own research, I see self-reports of the experience of alienation offline and specifically finding places of belonging online to offset that, that loneliness and, and um, you know, feeling like you don't belong anywhere. So I've been working on this concept called textual community. Side note, I hate the phrase textual community, but I have been working on this for <laughs> almost a year, and it is the best that I have gotten so far. If you would like a mention in my dissertation acknowledgments and you have a better phrase after I give this presentation, please tweet it to me or talk to me afterwards. So what is a textual community? First, my definition of text is coming out of a media studies and rhetorical studies framework, specifically um, what Michael McGee calls fragments of apparently finished discourse. He's writing at a time when rhetoricians were really studying individual rhetorical addresses and texts as these sort of self-contained units that could really be analyzed very deeply and without much accounting for the social context. So what he's calling for is um, don't do that because that is practically useless. And I'm also looking at um, texts as parts of flows and textual formations. This is what Nick Holdry is describing um, when he writes in 2000 about cultural studies as having a or needing a materialist methodology. In other words, not just kind of looking at very subjective, interpretive approaches to text, although those are also valuable, but trying to understand how they actually exist in the world. Um, just a brief example, Joke Hermes talks about put-downable texts, the, ways that, the way that you don't read War and Peace the same way you read a magazine. And that's part of the methodology that Coldry's calling for here. For my purposes, texts are blog posts, images, uh, copy pasta. So you know, those are sort of like famous stories or story formats that get repeated over and over again, specifically on 4chan. Um, and so for community, I'm working off a pretty basic sociological definition that comes from Ferdinand Tunis. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. Um, his concept, Gemeinschaft, which is German, roughly translates to community. And it's basically voluntary personal interactions that are based on shared values and beliefs. So kind of a more straightforward definition of textual community. It's a social unit in which in interaction is voluntary, personal, and based on shared values. It's text-based. All interaction is mediated, or at least you don't require any physically co-present interaction. Not to say that there is never any or that that negates your textualness of your community, but typically it just not, doesn't happen. And finally, these shared values, and this is key, are determined by and shift according to the texts that circulate, what gains traction, what doesn't. Um, one of the things I like about the concept, even if I don't like the term, is that it lets us draw distinctions among different types of communities. So not all digital spaces are textual communities, right? Um, and not all communities are textual, for example, parent-teacher associations, activist groups, and not all textual spaces are communities. Take um, any number of the cat-related subreddits, these are very textual, it's about the circulation of text, but unless you're willing to extend shared beliefs and values to the idea that cats are great and we love them, <laughs> probably, probably doesn't fall under the parameters of a community, so. Textual community is um, intimately wrapped up in platform affordances, and that's another reason that I like it as a method, because it requires that we take into account different, pl different platforms are different, right? So what kinds of levels of anonymity do you have, and to what extent does that allow you to express opinions that are either distasteful or dangerous, for better or for worse? Voting and quantification is a means to determine the value of particular community contributions. Um, where do you congregate? Do you have like a news feed or a central kind of forum page as in Reddit? Or are you seeking out hashtags? And how do you text circulate and also the barriers to entry, which I'll talk about at some length. So I pick 
these two case studies are from my dissertation, and they're two very different platforms. If you've ever used Reddit and 4chan, they're almost like foils for each other in being one being distinctly hierarchical and re relying on voting and also having fixed usernames, fixed identities, versus 4chan, which is um, sort of organized chaos. And I'm looking specifically at the Red Pill, which is a neo-masculist, um, misogynist movement, and I'm also looking at Robot 9000, Really hard to pick an image to represent R9K, so I picked Sad Pepe. I really hope that there's somebody out there that knows what R9K is, otherwise it's probably just kind of um, obscure, but anyway. So the red pill describes itself as a discussion of sexual strategy in a culture increasingly lacking a positive identity for men. If um, the metaphor doesn't smack you over the head enough, uh, feminism is the blue pill, it's the matrix. Um, and so you take the red pill and you fight against the feminist, uh, I don't know, machines, I guess, that are exploiting you. <laughs> <laughs> if you follow the metaphor to its logical conclusion, it does really get uh, kind of silly. It's based in this sort of self-help, neoliberal identity maintenance politics that are applied to sex and dating, but also to all sorts of other arenas of life, just socializing generally, professional development. And it's also predicated on Darwinian and capitalist competition. Both of those discourses are highly naturalized in the Red Pill. So all of this adds up to the pursuit of happiness that's determined through um, your own self-interest. They talk all the time about how it's completely amoral. All you are doing is just kind of looking out for your own interests, just like everybody else. What's very interesting about the Red Pill as a textual community is that the barriers to entry are really low, and I'm gonna get into some of the specifics of how Reddit as a platform lets that happen, but they're really evangelizing. They want to spread the word, and this is really contrary to R9K. Um, robot users see themselves as social outcasts. Most of their personal stories are about awkward interactions, especially with women. Um, you might know them better as Forever Alones. That's another, and they call themselves that as well. Lots of discussions of um, mental illness, loneliness, suicidal, and homicidal ideation. If anybody remembers the Oregon Community College shooting that happened last October, um, that the person who, it's widely believed, and it seems very likely that the person that did that posted on R9K right before, warning people not to go to school if they lived in that region of the country. Um, and they were lauded as a hero by many users on R9K. So it's a deeply personal, very distasteful, maybe very dangerous idea that can really only be shared by nature of the um, complete anonymity of 4chan. And contrary to the red pill, they have no interest in self-improvement. And also, there are very high barriers to entry. It's v You have to spend a lot of time if you really are just self-flagellating like I am and you really want to understand this community. You have to spend a lot of time doing outside research. It's not the kind of place that you can just jump into and get it the way you can with the red pill. And I like comparing these two case studies because they both have um, very similar, um, they're addressing similar social phenomena, similar social dynamics, the rapid changes in gender regimes over the last few decades. And they're sharing very similar personal experiences, unsatisfying interactions with, um, unsatisfying heterosexual cis-normative interactions specifically. But they all have very different ideologies and philosophies and they take place on very different platforms with very different affordances. So Reddit predicated on hierarchy, voting, moderation, rules. There's a lot of quantification. They're, they're obsessed with tracking um, their number of subscribers over time, as well as the self-reported demographics that the moderators try to figure out every year. And they, ha they use archives to create stability over time. There are so many examples of how they do this, but I'm going to stick to the sidebar just because it's a really stark example. Here you can see the list of rules, a glossary, which is key because they use so many you know, specific terminologies, jargon, um, acronyms. If you notice here, um, it's the second blue link, endorse contributors, respect the tag. This is really fascinating to me. So there are little flares that show up next to some users' usernames. And these indicate kind of, it's almost like an eldership, you know, it's a, you should be respected because you have this flare next to your name. People should take what you say seriously. Red Pill Vanguard, these are kind of the oldest users. They've been around since the beginning. Um, endorsed and then senior endorsed means you've been endorsed for a long time and you still contribute to the community. Uh, beginner text, introductory text. So if you don't, if you just stumbled upon this and you're interested, here's what you want to read. 
And then you can go into the more intermediate text, the theory reading. Uh, my favorites personally are women, the most responsible teenager in the house, and sexual strategy is amoral. Did you know you can get outside of morality? Well, let me tell you about it. <laughs> Um, there's also, uh, you know, they even kind of aggregate and centralize the whole network. So you have the red pill women, which is where, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. Women are not really encouraged to, to contribute to, like, the main red pill subreddit. So they have their own enclave. Um, Alt-TRP, interestingly, uh, TRP philosophy for gay men. That is a real interesting um, place to watch as well. And then the archives. So, so you can see here that like things are really being canonized. Things are being aggregated in a way that lowers the barriers to entry and makes it really easy for you to figure this place out quickly. Now compare that with 4chan. This is the only place on R9K where you will find how you should be posting. And it's essentially a long drawn out explanation of the fact that the board is moderated <coughs> by a bot that will not let you post anything that's ever been posted there before. No reposts. If you repost, you'll be muted. Every time you repost, you'll be mu muted. And to the two, so, yeah, two to the end, rather. So, and it's an ugly interface, and it's confusing. And if you don't know who Pepe is, or what is up with that truck, or any of the other hundreds of images that they post, and the really insular language that they use, you're screwed. The only way you can figure any of that out is by going to places like Encyclopedia Dramatica, or Know Your Meme, which, um, let me tell you, 4chan and R9K especially, hate these websites, because it gives so-called normies, people who are outside of R9K, and who are not social outcasts, they fit into society, it gives them an in. <laughs> um, it lets them learn all of, their, all of their terminology, and all of their kind of cultural tropes, and um, now they are among us, and that is very uh, distasteful to them. So what I like about this concept is that it kind of forces us to look at platforms as uh, integral to community formation, which I think can sometimes among new media scholars be maybe like put on the back burner. This really brings it to the forefront. And it's also not deterministic, at least I hope so. Maybe you'll tell me if it's not deterministic. It's important for me to understand how cultural studies can be a method because it's often been kind of derided as not being methodological, as not having, <sighs> thank you, <laughs> um, as not having like a, a kind of central method. And so I think that this gives, at least for people who are doing cultural studies in new media environments, a kind of way to deal with that. And it also lets us make distinctions among varieties of digital communities so that we can deal with the ever-present problem of narrowing the scope of our research. I'm looking at this and not that. So thank you very much. Okay, so that was awesome. So one of the reasons I was really excited to moderate a panel called Politics of Platforms is that I also do work on digitally mediated abuse, in particular like revenge porn, and harassment, especially gendered harassment. And one of the things that drives me absolutely batty about working on that issue area is the extent to which platforms claim neutrality. Like they will say, oh, we cannot do anything, we are just third parties, people put content on us, it's not our fault, eh. And the thing about this is that like affordances are real, right? Everything about how these platforms are built, everything about what is easy to do and what is not so easy to do, influences and affects how people use those platforms. So the question that I want to open Q&A by posing to our panel is for each of you, for the area or sites that you study, if you could change one thing about how your site or area worked to have a more politically progressive impact on how that site or type of technology is used, what would it be? In two or three sentences. The end. <laughs> all right. So uh, the poly the sort of sites I study, I guess, would be all of them. So this is probably a hard <laughs> question to answer. But I guess part of uh, the method, the thing that I would like to suggest is that like I wish lawyers did user stories, right? Like I like I think that one of the things that happens when uh, you see lawyers interacting with communities and interacting with abuse is that they do not consider the role of design, both affordances and sort of the these systems as like legitimate ways to control behavior. They consider legal mechanisms as the appropriate ways to control behavior. So I wish you lawyers did user stories and that's my answer. Anybody? 
So one of the tricky things about Reddit and 4chan and my area specifically is that the potential for like liberatory ideologies is really um, there. How do you go into Reddit and or to, to the red pill and say like, what if you guys were less misogynist? It's not really like there's nothing you could do with the platform to make that happen. Um, <laughs> for Reddit broadly, though, and for 4chan, I, I don't really I think kind of 4chan is like a lost cause. So. Um, but for Reddit, um, the kind of one of the nice things about Reddit is that each subreddit can determine its own community values to some extent. And so moderators um, can moderate such that everybody who's contributing has to stick to those values and beliefs. I would like it if Reddit paid moderators. That's pretty much what I would change. Reddit paid them, yeah. Um, okay, so with rec I don't actually use Facebook, so I don't entirely know what it's like in there, but I would imagine that, um, the, the, well, one platform that I do use is Twitter, and there is a lot of kind of like user desire for specific tools around blocking. And I think obviously ch uh, implementing those would be technically trivial, uh, I can tell you. Um, although mm, there might be some edge cases. Uh, but with regard to my paper particularly, I think um, what will be, so at the moment Facebook are entirely in control of React and the React community and the software built built around it um, that they open source. Uh, and no one's really talked about this, but it disturbed me. So for example, last year at React Europe conference where they unveiled lots of this stuff, um, basically no, not a single person put their hand and said, okay, cool, well, but you're in charge of this. Isn't that problematic in some kind of way? Like what? Uh, and also they have this weird legal agreement I don't fully understand that basically if you start competing with Facebook in certain ways, they can just remove your right to use uh, these platforms, uh, which is why um, anecdotally on, on Hacker News, which is the place for uh, engineers uh, doing anecdotes, um, uh, basically uh, you, 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 hear, you hear that apparently Google are banned from using React, even though it's perhaps the best cl in-class technology because they're, Google are really worried that if they start competing, say doing uh, Google+, Plus, uh, they will get the rug pulled from under them. So in, in terms of like one concrete measure, I think like, taking these technologies and putting them into a, uh, uh, a non-corporate you know, governance like body uh, in the same way that a lot of other open source projects uh, would be um, would be a really good move, and I, I suggest that it will never happen. I don't I don't have anything very concrete, but I was just going to revisit uh, a point that I wanted to emphasize more than I think I did, which is that I think what what we can get out of thinking of what uh, Peter Thiel is using Rene Girard's theories for is that he understands platforms as a as a means to power essentially um, I mean he understands them very clearly as a as a way of wielding power um, in this age which he thinks is in a sense more effective than the state um, which I think is part of what um, is behind his kind of anti-statism sort of libertarianism um, but you know what's what's also interesting is that he because he's thinking about this theory that has to do with scapegoating, you know, essentially, it's uh, this this concept that you know societies are organized in part through the scapegoat mechanism, which sort of channels violence into more or less arbitrarily selected individuals, and that you know, to cr to make a very simple binary division, uh, you know, traditional societies this was ritualized in part of religion, right? In modern society, it breaks down, so you end up with this kind of constant crisis. <laughs> because you don't know sort of where to put the violence. Um, so I think, you know, what Thiel is thinking about is how, or w was thinking about, what's interesting is he's kind of moved away and sort of seems to be less interested in social media and again more interested in um, technology, in essentially, um, you know, data analysis um, linked to sort of national, directly linked to national security, which is interesting in relation to his anti-statism. But, you know, the point I would say is that he, um, uh, when we think about things like abuse and bullying and and um, various kinds of scapegoating that take place on online platforms, you know what's interesting is that if if we um, take him seriously, then that's that's a feature and not a bug, right? I mean, in other words, those energies are actually deliberately being channeled into those kind of platforms, in part um, so as to channel them away from sort of large-scale political reckonings, right? So I think that's part of what he was thinking, at least early on. And I think that he may have, um, he, he may be um, less 
uh, confident that that's actually working now, but um, it's certainly worth thinking about in any case. So. Okay, so we're going to move to open Q and A, and you basically have an option for asking questions. If you did theater like I did, and you could project really well, feel free to just state your question from where you are very loudly. Or if you are not feeling so projecty, um, I can come to you with the microphone and try not to hit too many people with the cord. So who's got a question for our panel? Over yonder. Hi, Alex. Um, so could you go back to your last slide, actually, where there was? Um, Who, me? Yes. Yes, you. I don't think I can. OK. <laughs> um, where there was like an ascension of Facebook over um, other platforms. Um, could you just go over what you were saying there? Because I was really engrossed with the internet. Sorry. <coughs> Uh, okay, cool. Um, so that's not a diagram of Facebook taking over the platforms as such. Uh, it's a diagram of Mark Zuckerberg's magical 10-year plan for making Facebook really, really good and convincing investors that's great. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, so that's what it is. And I, I was trying to make the point that I think that we need to think, uh, and people, analysts and, and tech critical people aren't thinking, because maybe they haven't encountered it or so on and so forth, about... Um, Facebook doing all this stuff around DX, developer experience, uh, are, you know, trying to make their te the technologies used to compose Facebook useful in a generic sense, uh, and how this this is probably forms part of their 10-year um, plan. And I haven't watched all the videos from um, F8, which is the Facebook developer conference where that slide is taken, but I would fully imagine there's probably some talk about how um, React, and there's even more stuff around this, like they have their own uh, IDE, which is like a you know a, a text editor. Uh, they have their own test runners. They have this entirely uh, complete suite of stuff that uh, developers can get involved with. And yeah, so that's why I was trying to make a point in that last slide. Next question. Yeah. Um, my question is for Bridget, and I was. Brittany. Yeah, Brittany. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know what? When people screw up my name, it is always Bridget. So <laughs> <laughs> you're not you're not alone. Um, so you were presenting R9K and the red pill as sort of encapsulating opposite ends of this sort of uh, masculine ideology, but also having sort of oppositional um, organizational structures. And I was wondering if your implication was that the different approaches to this ideology are coming from uh, radical opposition in the way the platforms are structured and how that might take place. Yeah, okay, thanks. So I, um, had I been more judicious with my time, my kind of point that I would like to hammer home is that um, this, there's a double articulation, right? It's platforms are not determinative of communities and com community ideologies don't only um, move to certain platforms because of those affordances, but they work together. Um, so. I like drawing a comparison between the red pill and R9K because they are so because where they dovetail is so interesting and where they radically split is also so interesting not only along ideological lines but because of platforms. That said, I don't think that they are so ideologically different because of their platforms and vice versa. Um, I think that all of it is sort of. Uh, Althusser talks about, um, the old dead French guy talks about overdetermination. <laughs> um, the problem, the eternal problem of causality, right? What makes what the way that it is? And trying to figure all that out, the nitty gritty of sociality, and especially when we get online and there's so much happening, I think it's uh, not only impossible, but not terribly kind of worth the, worth the time of hashing all of that out. But I do appreciate that question because that's a point that I should have, if I had put it in a bullet, slide, a bullet point on my final slide, I would have said it, but thank you. Next question. Yeah, in the plaid. <laughs> Can you speak up? Um, can you talk about 
talk a little bit more about what role that plays in some of the, the like environments that are created on those boards, and especially considering that those environments are generally the same across boards with very different topics. Yeah, so the question, just in case you couldn't hear it, was about the aesthetics of board chain, right? <laughs> Basically getting down to what, what it looks like. It's, it's ugly, um, and it's very distinctive. <laughs> So I think it's a lot, if you're coming to a new platform, and so, okay, Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and all of these other places, they spend millions and millions of dollars trying to figure out how to make it look flashy and pretty. Tumblr is probably a fantastic example of this. Oh my gosh, they're constantly making it look just more kind of drawing the eye and more pretty. 4chan um, does not do this, and I think that's very deliberate because it's kind of insular, high barriers to entry. How do you um, create a kind of community that can stay very tight-knit where you can um, so for example like a, a place like poll or B they they demonstrate their hot in R9k they demonstrate hostility to outsiders by picking up on them because they don't understand the cultural and social mores they don't understand the memes and on R9k they say get out normie and the, the the aesthetic of the platform itself really helps to support all of that because it's a lot harder if you have never been to a site before to sort through these like very small, dense, kind of weirdly colored lines of text. It's like light green on beige and then it, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like a welcoming, you don't go to 4chan and say, oh, I love it here already. Um, and so, and I kind of, again, I, I, it's not so much that I think the, the, the way it looks makes it that way or that the, the fact that it's insular causes the aesthetic, but rather they're, maybe they're just sort of like um, complimentary and it's, um, yeah, it just works together in that way based on lots and lots of factors. Stuart. Um, I wanted to ask a similar about, about the, the sort of the relationship between R9K and, and the Red Pill and the rest. I mean, it seems like R9K is a little bit more insular and, and doesn't sort of go out, but the Red Pill sort of does do more uh, evangelism. I don't know what the right word for that is. I mean, and, and do they do they talk about each other in different ways or do they sort of distinguish each other about like uh, they're allies but doing different work or they're actually opposing <laughs> or, what a great question. They uh, do talk about each other. They are not allies. They do not like each other. Um, you know, the red pill is people in normie training and robots are sad, pathetic, forever alone. So, so a key tenet of the red pill is that you do not put women on a platform. If you put a woman on a platform, you are uh, making her unattainable. She will treat you like a beta. She will suck resources from you without ever having sex with you. These, this, <laughs> so R9K robots are like classic betas. They are, um, each is the antithesis of the other. And so there's a powerful distaste. If somebody goes on R9K and says, look, all of you guys need to just get a job and start like lifting some weights and eat healthier and lose weight, what do they say? Get out, Normie. Like you, we don't, you know, they call them chads. Like, no, get out of here, you fucking chad. I don't, you know. Um, <laughs> there's a re pepe, which is like an angry pepe frog that just says re over the top of it, and they'll post that, you know. So, um, similarly, <laughs> uh, the red pill doesn't waste their time with kind of cynicism and misanthropy and um, feeling sad for yourself. If you express any of those sentiments on the red pill, they will tell you, like, shut up, get out, come back when you're ready to do something about it, so. Pink in the back? Yeah, um, this is kind of similar vein to what he was asking, but uh, rather than aesthetics, aesthetics more functionality when, with these platforms. Obviously, designers and developers are making decisions that are influencing the way interactions play out there. Um, but in terms of the way that platforms revolt when changes are made, and either the, the social networks and the Tumblr totally freaks out anytime anything is changed in the UI. Um, you know, the developers freak out when Google tries to change Angular or even Facebook users. I'm just wondering how much is there in terms of the relationship between those developers and designers who are then part of this larger entity that has very clear business interests and then user interests and how that influences the directions that those communities develop. Is that to everyone? I was kind of tossing it out to everybody just because yeah. in terms okay, of like first, the developer angle and then I guess the user angle. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly go first. Um, yeah, it is interesting uh, how you get that backlash, but um, anyone who's actually rolled out a website um, will know that that backlash is fully inevitable, regardless of if the changes are significantly better. Um, which is, you know, it has to be managed, and it's important if you actually care about those communities to manage that. 
Um, so what was, the, what was the core of your question, sorry? Well, I think it's just, I, I'm really interested in the way that there is the platform role and how that relates to yeah, well, the, the spaces are maintained. Sure. Uh, I mean, the problem with the platform revolt is you've got no levers, really. I mean, if Facebook tomorrow decided to, say, remove the chat feature, which they'll never do because it's the big thing they're going to do in the next few years, they decided to do that. Um, I'd imagine, well, people would still continue to use Facebook. I think the ubiquity and power of these platforms is that everyone uses them. And if you want to, um, you know, be involved in certain things, you want to you know, talk to your friends and blah, 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 you have to do them. So basically, the users tend to just suck it up and get annoyed and rant about it. Uh, so for example, that notification thing um, in the presentation the engineer gave, basically, um, she, she mentioned that this was something that the users went on and on and on about. Um, and that's why, in a way, they came to build React to, to satisfy this particular new user need. So basically, users on these platforms uh, have very little leads to pull, particularly if the platform is at scale. Um, so I, I agree that I think often the backlash is, e is seen as inevitable and seen as sort of like, no matter what we do, these users aren't happy. Um, and I think that actually functionally contributes to a culture that ignores user feedback and uh, promotes abuse, right? Because people who are very used to being like, everyone hates us no matter what we do, are not do not deal well when it's like, everyone hates us and now they're getting death threats, right? And I actually think that like legal invocations of legal schemas sometimes can sort of rebut the sort of this is just a normal backlash against our platform right like people are like no it's bad because like what these what what's happening on your platform is illegal and that actually creates power gives some power to users sort of contrary to the like lever the lack of levers but i do think that like at least my experience has been sometimes that uh because user backlash and sort of user distaste is seen as inevitable, it can be difficult for people who are experiencing sort of real distress from the way platforms are set up to distinguish themselves from just sort of on yet another user who's upset about the UI changes kind of thing. So we're almost out of time. We have about like 45 seconds. And just in the interest of progressive stack, I am wondering if anyone on like the less masculine end of the gender spectrum has a question, just so we can have a more representative <laughs> discussion. <laughs> I'm going to ask a similar question, though, as to what was already asked. Um, so I'm speaking as a product designer. Uh, one of the things that we consider as designers is a, the development of something like a universal pattern. And obviously, that's impossible to actually create. Um, but I'm curious to hear your perspectives on um, whether there are platforms that exist that uh, do a really good job or that we should be more trying to emulate here, um, especially given that those universal patterns sort of, uh, they encourage certain kinds of behavior as we've sort of discussed here already. Um, so I think answering this question is very difficult for me. Um, uh, I think that there are some platforms that have taken steps, steps to be very thoughtful in how they handle and decide what abuse is, and I think that that is very helpful. Um, I think one thing that uh, people should spend more time on, and that I think, um, I, uh, I actually am really hesitant to just give specific examples on a live stream, um, but is uh, does thinking about designing uh, very specifically how people react to uh, and relate to reporting, reporting abuse. Um, and I can see we're out of time, so I'm going to stop now. Unless other people have things to say. We're getting kicked out, baby. Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for coming.